Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, August the 24th, 2022. It is currently 11.08 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central Studios, located right here in Abilene, Texas. Well, I came up with a great idea. I mean, I I thought it was a great idea. Let's teach everyone who has an internet connection, anyone who wants to hear it, they can find it and place it on all the podcast apps, place it on all the platforms. Let me take the time and do the work to teach as many people as possible, teach people around the world what I am calling the most comprehensive book Bible study method in existence, right? We'll take four methods of Bible study and we'll group them together. I'll teach everyone the book background method. I'll teach everyone the book survey method. I'll teach everyone the chapter analysis method. And then I will teach everyone the book synthesis method. I will group these together into one method and teach everyone the method. All right. Now that sounds like a pretty good idea. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that idea. You don't know how many people will actually use the method. You don't know how many people will actually be interested in the method, but it can't hurt to at least place, you know, all over the internet. Hey, here is a comprehensive book Bible study method. Use it if you would like. Share it with as many people as you want. That's a good idea. I mean, nobody could fault me for that. I think everyone would say... Well, I don't know if everyone would applaud, but I think everyone would be like, at least they would kind of shrug their shoulders. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, if that's what you want to do, no big deal. I don't think anyone would be hostile and go, that's a horrible idea. So, so far, so good. So I do that. Then I tell everyone, okay, you know that Bible study method I just taught you? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to use that method on the book of Amos. That's that's not a, that's not a bad idea. I give everyone some, I, I give them a short book so that they can begin to practice that method on an actual book of the Bible and actually engage in Bible study. Nothing wrong with that idea. I think that's a good idea. I even give everyone a list of tools that they will need in order to use these methods to study that book. I did that in the teaching of the methods. Nothing wrong with that. But then, oh, I can never stop myself. I can never stop myself. I decided to come up with a new idea, something unique, something different. And immediately I have realized I may have made a bad decision. And I make a lot of bad decisions, all right? But it's not because of a a lack of of trying to make good decisions. I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm trying to make good decisions, I just, my good decisions sometimes go bad. They go wrong. So here's what I was thinking. Okay, now, I've given everyone the Bible study method. I've given everyone the assignment. Now, I don't really need, I mean, at that point, I could just wash my hands and say, I'm done. I've done my part, right? I've given you the method. I've given you the book. I can just walk away, right? I can just walk away. And now what I could do is at different times, I could jump in and do some teaching on Amos, right? Just just do normal, everyday kind of teaching. Here's an overview on Amos. All right, we're going to begin Amos chapter 1. I, I could just do basic teaching, which may have been put together using some of those tools in the Bible study method, but don't really even mention the Bible study method. Just turn on the microphone and say, okay, while you're doing the comprehensive book Bible study method, I'm going to do some teaching and post some teaching on the book of Amos to simply supplement your study, right? And each day I could turn on the microphone or every couple of days and go, how's your study going along? If you need any help, just contact me, but you know, stay at it. Just don't give up. Keep working. In the meantime, here's a little teaching to supplement what you're doing. Now, that I think that would have been a pretty good idea. And I don't think anyone would have complained about that. But again, <laughs> no, no, no. I never can stop myself because I'm like, but everyone does that, right? 
I mean, how many podcasts, how many sermons are there out there on the book of Amos? You can find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands, sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. So what I would just be contributing to that. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, obviously. But I thought, you know, I've given everyone this very, 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 not only comprehensive book Bible study method, but some would say, it's somewhat complicated. It could be difficult. It could be confusing. It could be intimidating. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to find a way to turn on the microphone and kind of participate with everyone, right? Like live on the air with all of my reference tools, my notebook and all of my pencils, right? All of my pencils, there's a lot of them, right? I'll take all of my pencils, I'll take all of my reference tools, I'll take all of my Bibles, I'll take my notebooks, and live on the air kind of walk through each step of the Bible study method. Now, I thought that sounds like a great idea, right? That sounds like a great idea. You may even think, wow, I would listen to that. Well, if you go listen to the last Bible study exercise episode, Amos part three, you may change your mind because the more I've considered it, it really is going to be, I still have to figure out how can I do this in a way that is not only beneficial, but at the same time, somewhat engaging. I don't know how engaging it can be. Maybe, maybe I have to focus... Here's what I think. Trying to do it this way, I think it can be beneficial for those participating in the study. But I'm very aware that many people who will tune in are not participating in the study. They just see Amos part four and they're like, okay, I want to learn about Amos. And then they're like, wait, this is just some guy with a a bunch of pencils, like live on the air, just trying to take people step by step through some Bible study method that I don't care about. So like, do I... Do I become so concerned that people may tune in who don't get it that I stop myself from doing something that maybe would be beneficial for those who do get it? Do you see the kind of the the difficulty here? Which which way do I go? Do I focus on just, okay, I'm going to focus on doing that which will appeal to the larger number of people or I'm going to focus on on trying to do what may be beneficial to the smaller number of people, but this smaller number of people are the ones who are committed and dedicated and really want to engage in the actual study. Because I just believe if all I do, I believe if all I do is, okay, guys, I gave you I gave you the methods. You know the Bible study methods. I gave you your assignment, and, and I just carry on. I feel that many... Well, just they won't they won't either do the method or they'll start for like 15 minutes and then give up. So if I if I if maybe maybe it's not the most engaging, may, clearly it's it's a violation of podcasting 101 and what you're supposed to do. But I've never really followed those rules in anything that I do, right? I mean, even from the way I teach at my church, I go against the template. I go against the rules. But is there a place for this? Because it it's going to take a long time. Like the more I started thinking about it, like I did one episode yesterday doing that. And it was a little awkward. And it was a little like it just did not flow. It just it wasn't. It wasn't perfect because because I'm trying to t- like this is literally what's happening. I'm trying to talk to you. At the same time, I'm sitting there trying to write notes in my notebook and I'm trying to figure it out live in real time. Like that that leads to a lot of stumbling over words. Wait, is it the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary or is it the new illustrated? Like I like I'm trying to say words because I'm I'm saying a word, but my mind is sitting there focusing on, well, wait a minute. Okay, so Amos was okay. I'm trying to figure out the next part of what I'm saying. Like, I'm trying to do like three things. I'm trying to write. I'm trying to talk to you. And I'm trying to engage in a Bible study method. All live on the air. I think anyone would say, well, that was a dumb idea. I'm, I'm willing to admit it was a dumb idea. I'm willing to admit it. But 
Maybe, 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 maybe there's one person somewhere who'll be like, thank you so much for humiliating yourself hour after hour, taking me step by step through the Bible study method. Because literally, I'm just trying to walk. I'm just literally like, let's walk through it. Here we go. Step by step by step. So I, I'm i not going to stop trying. I'm not going to stop trying. I, I am going to commit myself to doing this. I, I think I think someone will get it. And I think many will not. But I'm going to continue to try so. Over now, some episodes I, I I do feel I have to jump in at different times and change up the format, right? Like sometimes it's going to be more just a straight up teaching, not so much walking through the steps. But I'm I'm going to really try. It just depends on the feedback, right? Because the the initial feedback was like, yeah, the Book of Amos. I'm excited for the study, right? And so and then. <laughs> When I do the episode where I kind of walk through it, it's more like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I don't want you to do that. I, 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 I didn't want you to do that. So, so you, you put it this way. You can tell me, hey, just don't, don't. You just what you're trying. Maybe it was unique, but it's not going to work. And I will, I will accept that. I will accept it. I may cry, but I'll accept it. But if you think that it's a interesting idea, even if it's just for entertainment purposes, I'm going to listen to this guy, try to talk, (laughs) try to do a Bible study method in real time. (laughs) Okay. And try to be writing things down all live on the air. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. A lot can go wrong because I don't know if you realize when you're trying to actually do the study, your mind's in, your mind is engaged in looking at what you're looking at and looking forward, okay, then you have to write, that's a different part of your mind, and then I also have to talk in an engaging way to the podcast audience who's listening to me live. That's trying to do, like, really three different parts of the brain really trying to all function at the same time, so I don't know. Maybe it's just a social experiment uh, in, in real time, but that's what we're going to do today. I don't know what you're doing today, I don't know what's going on, but if you haven't done your, worked on any of your Bible study for today, you're going to get to hear me do a little bit of work. Now I've done, I've, I, just like the last time I do have things already written down. I do already have things written down, but it's more just kind of giving me a kind of a, a starting point where I, I, you know, I don't have to just right from the start go, okay, guys, give me 10 minutes to get something down so we can start. No, I need something already down, but we're going to try to advance this into where I think we're we're very important. So we're doing the book background method. We did kind of an overview of the minor prophets. I did a little bit of work on that. I thought that one went pretty good, but that one was more straight up teaching. I had all of that written out. I was ready to go. But once, because that really wasn't a part of the actual method of Bible study. Then we got to the book background method. And as soon as we got to the book background method, if you are, if you're familiar with the method, you know that we have to, first of all, we kind of confronted with what we sometimes refer to as the vital questions, the vital questions. We sometimes, uh, we refer to these as who, when, where, why, whom, what. And, and the main thing I want you to know about these vital questions is just know that you're, I, the goal here is not for you to just go, okay, I'm going to ask one who question, one when question, one where question, one why question, one whom question, and one what question. The, the goal is not to just try to restrict it. The goal is these are your good friends and you use these good friends to ask as many questions necessary so that you can learn as much about the background of the book because we can't get into the book until we understand the background of the book. So so really it's unlimited. So that's one of the things I was trying to demonstrate. Well, let's kind of go through this, all right? We started off with this. Who wrote the book? And the answer is Amos or the prophet Amos. And that comes from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51. I literally wanting you to write down the references. That's another thing I'm trying to help you as we go through this. Literally write down the reference. 
And remember, I told you to come up with an abbreviation for all of them. So NIBD is Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51. And then, of course, we know from Amos chapter 1, verse 1, even though we're not really trying to get into the book yet, that Amos, that, that the book of Amos contains the words of Amos and the prophecies that he gave, all right? So we, we looked at all of that. Now, immediately after we, we decide who wrote the book, we could immediately jump to, when was the book written? written? So in other words, you could say, who wrote the book? Amos, when was the book written? That's what a lot of people will do. Who, when? But of course, I wanted to demonstrate to you, no, it's not about how quickly you make it through this. It's about how in-depth you are. The goal here is this is a comprehensive method. So I need to know, okay, I mean, this is just true with any, I mean, again, the your ability to ask good questions is what determines the quality of your Bible study. So if I'm like, who wrote the book of Amos? Amos. Okay. Then my next question is going to be, what do we know about Amos? What do we know about Amos? That, that should be the next logical progression of thought. What do we know about him? So we started working on this. What do we know about Amos? Well, we know what his name means. Burden bearer, according to the Ultimate Bible Guide, page 185. It also means just burden. So it's burden bearer or just burden, according to the Blue Letter Bible app. All right? So we know a little bit about his name. Now, immediately... There was another question. Now, I, I, I just asked, what do we know about him? All right, and we know that his name means burden bearer. But before we can continue answering the question, what do we know about him? I had to interrupt that and ask another question. What could be the significance of the meaning of his name? Okay, now, or burden bearer. Okay, great. Is that important? Why is that important? So I put, I wrote it out. What could be the significance of his name? And we f figured this out. Prophets frequently spoke of their messages as burdens. A prophetic utterance could be ominous and foreboding. A, a denouncing of evil and a pronouncing of judgment against a place or people. And you can see this idea of their message, their words being a burden. Isaiah 13, 1, Ezekiel 12, 10. And that is based off the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 232. So this gives me the idea that Amos, he's the one who wrote the book. What do I know about him? His name means burden bearer. And that seems to signify that he has a message that is very much a burden. It's ominous. It's foreboding. It's a pronouncement of judgment against a people or place. And it could mean, I, I, I do find it interesting that the blue letter Bible app doesn't say burden bearer, just say, just says burden. The message is a burden, but in some ways, Amos himself may be a burden to the people because a burden is something that's ominous and bad, and, and Amos may bother them. He may be a burden himself. So there's a little like play on words there that we could really take apart. All right, so now after we I answered that question, I go back to what do we know about Amos? The second thing we know about him, he's a herdsman. We see this in Amos 1.1 and the New uh, Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51. We also know that he can be referred to, according to the Blue Letter Bible app, as a sheep raiser, a sheep dealer, or a sheep tender. And we also know that he was a gatherer of sycamore figs, according to the Ultimate Bible Guide, page 189 and Amos chapter 7, verse 14. I did ask this question then, kind of, again, going back from the original question, what do we know about Amos? I had to drop, I had to kind of throw this in. Is there possibly any significance to his occupation? I did not answer it live on the air. I was hoping someone else would jump in and go, hey, you asked that question. Here's my answer. So I will ask everyone, is there any possible significance to his occupation? So what do we know about Amos? We know the meaning of his name. What else do we know? We know his occupation. He was a herdsman a keeper of sheep, a sheep raiser, a sheep dealer, a sheep tenderer, a tender, okay, is the word. And um, well, there you go. We know where he was from. He was from a place called Tekoa. Uh, we find this in Amos 1.1. 1, 1, and this is interesting. I still think this is interesting. I mentioned it yesterday and I thought someone would say something. 
I thought someone would be like, wait, wait, he's from where? He, he, he's from where? I thought someone would say, wait, I got a question. Are you sure that's where he's from? <laughs> well, I, I know it's obvious he's from Tekoa, but look, l- listen to the, what we learned about Tekoa. Tekoa is a village near Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah. Please note, it, he lived in a village in the southern kingdom of Judah. A village near Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judah. That's from Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51. We also, look, again, from Tekoa, the town was just a few miles from the busy caravan caravan, caravan route linking Jerusalem with Hebron and Beersheba. And then I asked, is there any significance from where he is from? And, well, no, 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 no one, no one, no one answered that. Then I asked, is there any significance or no? Then I asked, uh, is Amos mentioned in any other scripture? Now, no, nobody has given me an answer yet. Nobody has given me an answer yet. But is Amos mentioned in any other scripture? But then we w- went on. Again, remember the question we're trying to ask here. What do we know about Amos? And there's two more things. He wasn't a son of a prophet. The Ultimate Bible Guide, page 189 in Amos 714. And he wasn't a prophet. Uh, Amos 714 in the Ultimate Bible Guide, page 189. Those are all the things we learned about Amos. Now, I know that that's all review, but I just what I want to show you is how I'm, I structured it. And I also wanted to throw some of those things out that no one bothered to answer because I think there's some things maybe there, especially that Tekoa was in the southern kingdom of Judah, was in the southern kingdom of Judah was in the southern, I can't, I'm going to keep emphasizing that because remember now this, this gives us a clue that this is occurring during the divided kingdom, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. He lives in the south. So what, what, what would you expect? I think you should expect something, all right? Now, today, what we're going to do, we're going to move on to the next question, all right? Who wrote the book? What do we know about Amos? Now, when was the book written? When was the book written? Now, I, 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 there's, there's so much we could do here. Always remember, and I think this is important, well, with a lot of this, because some people said they, they didn't look certain things up because they were afraid that they were just going to, that I would say that you're, you're getting distracted and you're getting off point. Let me just remind you of this. For anything you see, and you feel like you're going to pursue it, you just have to stop and ask yourself the question. Will this information contribute to my understanding the background of the book? Or will this information distract me from my study of the background of the book? Will this information contribute to my understanding of the background, or will it distract me from my study of the background? Only you can figure that out. I mean, I mean, and now now sometimes you'll start and go, oh, oh, this is going to help me. And then you'll realize, what am I doing? I'm, you're off worrying about something that's not going to really ultimately matter. All right. But when it comes to when questions, when was the book written? When did the events occur? Just remember that at times it can be a little maddening. And here's the reason why. The more resources you have, (laughs) the more dates you will find. The more books you look into, the more numbers you will find. And sometimes what you have to say is just you have to say, we cannot be dogmatic about some of these dates, but here's some general ideas. I'm not going to go through everything that I looked at today and other things that people shared today. I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to give a very basic, point you in certain directions on this. So I this is what I did. We've got to figure out on the when question here. We need to figure out when did the events occur and when was the book written? Now, I keep trying to make that distinction because some and sometimes in the Bible, what happens, especially with some commentaries and some 
dictionaries. They say just almost seem to group it together that the book was, they almost act like the book was being written at the exact moment the words were being spoken or the events were occurring. And in many, I mean, in some cases, you just know that's not the case. If Moses writes Genesis, clearly the book was written much later after the events. All right, does that make sense? All right, so so in, in when it comes to the prophets and their prophecies, especially if we go back to the 1800s coming out of Europe and higher criticism, it was very common for them to go, no, 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 no. They wrote that after those prophecies were fulfilled, that, like the prophecies were fulfilled. They wrote the book much later to make it look like the prophecies were fulfilled. So the dating of some of these things can be very important and can be controversial. So we have, when did the events occur? When was the book written? Right? Because some cases you may have the prophet giving a prophecy, but the book is not written till later. Well, how much later? If the book was written after the fact, is it possible that then the book, you could at least be from a skeptic standpoint. Well, is it possible then that it wasn't actually prophecy? It's just written as prophecy because it was written after the event occurred. So clearly th that can be important, but I just think I like to make sure there's a distinction. This is when the events were occurring. This one, when the book was written. So that when question involves too. I like to kind of combine them together, right? So when, when was the prophecy? When were the events? Well, let's see what we can find out a little bit when it comes to the book of Amos. What can we discover? Well, this is some things I wrote down this morning. When, I, I started off with, when did the events occur? Amos prophesied during the reigns of King Uzziah in Judah and King Jeroboam II in Israel. This is according to Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51. We also see this in Amos 1.1. This places his prophecy at about 760 B.C., according to Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Now, if you take the reign of the two kings, this is just will give you some kind of just a clue. If you look up the reigns of those two kings, if you go to Amos chapter 1, verse 1, I'll just show you this. If you go to Amos chapter 1, verse 1, and I, and I don't, I don't I, in the background, I try not to get us too much into the text, but sometimes you have to. If I'm doing the book background method kind of by, by itself, and it's not a part of this comprehensive Bible study method, then I, I'm more, I almost kind of lead you into the book to find a lot of information. Here, I'm trying to just ha find, help you find the information in outside resources, okay? Because the next steps are going to be taking the book apart, taking the book apart. And then if we find something in the book that goes against all of the information that we've already found, that that will be very instructive and very helpful, all right? So if I was teaching the book background method by itself, I would probably be having you look in the Bible itself for some of the information, but there, there's, a, there's a method to the madness. But if you look at Amos chapter 1, verse 1, we read this. The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So if we can figure out when Uzziah reigned and when Jeroboam the second reigned, all right, we know when they, so in other words, the prophecy can't happen until both of them are reigning and the prophecy obviously has to end when one of them stops reigning. So they both have to be reigning as kings and the prophecy can't go on after one of them is no longer reigning because it happens during the days of their reign. So if you can find the dates of their, their reigns, you know the prophecy occurs somewhere in between that. It's also interesting that we have this phrase, two years before the earthquake. Two years before. When did the earthquake occur? When did the earthquake occur? Someone had a, a source that I think they placed it at 7, 750 BC. I believe, uh, I believe that that's the case. Um, but you can, you can try to look that up. So that kind of gives you a range. So what we, what we, I think we're pretty dogmatic on it. 
that it appears that his prophecy is taking place somewhere around 760 B.C. 760 B.C. So when was the book written? Well, possibly it was written sometime after the prophecy was given, perhaps after he returned to Tekoa, and this is according to the Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 51, all right? So, if the prophecy is 760, it's going to be, and the book's going to be written sometime after, according to the Ultimate Bible Guide, they seem to indicate the book would have been written around 760. 50 BC, so about 10 years later, about 10 years later. It seems like a long time to wait to write it down. Now, if if the prophecy is given in 760, right, there's a possibility, because according to Amos 1.1, he does this two years before the earthquake. Well, if he's giving the prophecy in 750, that or 760, this would have the earthquake happen, happening around 758. Well, and then, and then the book is written in 750. Maybe there was a delay in writing the book because of the earthquake, and you think the earthquake had to be somewhat significant for it to be written down. Well, a lot of speculation, but we know this. The prophecy is around 760. I, th- I think almost, I think most agree with that. I think, I think if you try to limit where it could be, 760, and again, you can look at the reign of the two kings, and you can try to limit it down if you would like, but around 760... Then you possibly have the earthquake happening two years later. That would be 758. And then you have him possibly then returning to to Koa. We don't know exactly when. And that places him possibly writing it around 750. He could have written it at 755 BC, 756. Maybe it wasn't that long after, but he ultimately writes it then. All right. So if you if you come across anything that has the dating of the earthquake mentioned in Amos 1 1, you just know the prophecy seemed to be two years prior to that. All right. Now, where was the book written? This one is just pure speculation. This seems to be to be pure speculation. Um, and I, I didn't even write down a source. I think the new uh, I think uh, the ultimate Bible guide may have said this or maybe it was Jensen's survey. I don't remember the uh, because the reason I didn't write it down is they didn't really have any dogmatic like they couldn't really say we've got clear evidence. They don't have any scripture. They don't have anything. But most believe, well, he, he possibly wrote it when he returned to Tekoa. At some point, he went back to Tekoa like he was he was a. If you think of Amos, it's almost like he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't the son of a prophet, but he gets commissioned to be a prophet for a temporary period of time. And it appears possibly that he gave his prophecy and then he returned back to Tekoa. Now, if you have something different, that's okay. Remember a lot of this, I just kind of throw out there to see what you find or what you think. So possibly written around 750, the the prophecy 760, written 750, an earthquake maybe around 750. Uh, 58, around 758. If I said 748, I apologize. 758. And then he goes back to uh, Tekoa. There he writes the book. Now, here is the big question today. All of that's just kind of interesting, gives us some kind of concept time. That's not as significant. Like, Like, here's what I would say. And again, I'm trying my best to walk you through these concepts. And I think this is important. Um, And I think this is very important here. Um, When it comes to these dates, there are times the dating of a book, there's times the dating of a book can be super, 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 super significant, right? Like I think Hebrews, the dating of that book is super important. I think there are other times where the dating of the book isn't as significant. And you, and it's sometimes hard when you're doing the book background to figure it out. So here's what I would always say. When you're doing the book background part, when it comes to the dating, just get a general idea. Just get a, a basic understanding. Now listen to me. And don't overthink it. Now once you get into the book and you start realizing whoa, the dating of this could be massively significant. 
you may have to then go do additional work on the dating. Sometimes the the more precise the dating of the book is, the more important it can be. If we find out that that, that that's the case, we'll back up. You it's always you always got to make these decisions and doing a, a, a in-depth Bible study. You got to go, okay, how much do I spend time pursuing this? And how much do I go, look, we got the basic idea. We got the general idea. We got the general play. We got the general time. We got, okay, we, we're good to go. Let's go. And then once we get in, we may go, man, we messed up. Oh, man, we should have spent way more time on the timing of this book because now we got some problems here. It's always okay to back up. It's Look, it's, it's better not to get bogged down and move forward and have to go backwards than to get bogged down and all you're doing is slowing yourself down when you didn't really need to. Typically, you're going to realize, I messed up. Man, I messed up. Yeah. So it's like, you'll get into the book and you're like, what did I, why did I skip that? It's okay. It's okay. Go back. See, that's why you write in pencil, right? Okay. Even if you don't write in pencil, who cares? If you're like, well, my notebook's all messed up. It's okay. What I always say is as I'm writing in a notebook, I, I just think this is important. Man, I, I don't care how it looks. I don't care if things are spelled right. It's just all messy, and I'm just boom, 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 just writing. And then at some later time, and this is what I, I, I'm going to do this this time, at some later time, you can take all of that mess, and you can transfer it over to, if you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this, a computer that you could... You could tap you could tap it all out. You could type it all out and place it in a nice thing. Or you can go back and organize it in a unwritten form using pencil. I don't care what you use then, but at that point you have it all figured out. So the initial writing, don't be I, I don't worry about how per- perfect that initial writing is. I don't care what it looks like. All right. So that's just 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 a little tip. Now, this is the question of questions for today. This is so important. This is like, this is the million dollar question, right? This is the million. And now if we get this question wrong, it could have detrimental impact on our interpretation of the book. This one is where the we need dramatic music. This is where we need, I don't know, do we have, I don't have any dramatic music. But this, 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 at this moment, this is what you need. You need to hear this. Okay, that lightning makes you step back. That lightning makes whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to get struck by lightning because if you mess this up, you're going to get struck by lightning. And that's going to, that lightning strike is going to mean you're going to misinterpret the book. You've got to understand this. And here is how we place it, or here's the question we ask at this point. Are you ready? Here we go. Oh, this is so important. All right. We've got the who, we've got the when. Now, here is where we come. This is so, we've got the where. Now, why was the book written? Why was the prophecy given? This why question, this is, this is so much to the purpose of the book. Let me use this. To, I'm going to use our current study in Jude at Victory Baptist Church, and you can listen to all of that series on, well, any podcast app or the Church One app. You should listen to it. You'll notice that there is, if you if you go through, because of the way I teach, I, I do a lot of, I'm very interactive in my teaching, right? I do a lot of the kind of the Socratic method in my teaching, even for the people in my church. You'll notice that there's a, a massive, like there's two or three weeks where there's like kind of a back and forth between me and the congregation. There's like a, there's kind of a disagreement, right? And it kind of got frustrating because I kept asking a question and, and I felt like the people were, they were, they were not getting it. They were missing it. And I, and I, and I, I, I've went back and listened to it like 50 times going, what did I say wrong? How did, what did I, how did I confuse them? I still don't really know how I confused them. I think now they have it down. But when it comes to the book of Jude, so much of the preaching of of the book of Jude goes something like this. Look, you better be on the lookout. 
false teachers are going to come into the church and they're going to deceive you and you can be led astray by them. You got to be on the lookout for them. You got to be warning people about them so that they're not led astray and they're not carried off by the false doctrine. And, and that's how the book of Jude is sometimes preached. And whenever I hear that, I want to start yelling and screaming because I'm like, that is not the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book of Jude is clearly identified. Jude is writing to people who are, sp- I'm, I'm going to use Jude here just to demonstrate this. I just want to show you, we mess this question up, everything falls apart. This is why this next question is so important, all right? Let me demonstrate. Who is Jude writing to? He's writing to those who are sanctified, who are preserved, and who are called. These are people who are spiritually secure. They're already spiritually secure. So this is not about, he's not writing to to warn them to be on the lookout so that they will not be deceived. No, he's writing to spiritually secure people to motivate them, to encourage them Not to warn them to be on the lookout, but to encourage them to do this. Look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you, plead with you, beg with you, that you should earnestly contend for the faith. This is, Jude was not written to go, hey guys, watch out, watch out, they're going to get you. No, it was written to go, hey guys, you need to contend for the faith. And so much is, is so many times in the initial overview of Jude, the preacher will say it correctly, right? Oh, this book was to encourage people to contend for the faith. But when you get through the book, it's like, you better be on the lookout because those false teachers, they're going to deceive you. Those false teachers are going to get you. You got to be, no, the, the whole hermeneutical key to Jude is that the purpose of the book, it was written to encourage spiritually secure people to contend for the faith, not to be fearful or on the lookout because they could be deceived. That's not the way Jude is written. The purpose is clearly identified. You get the purpose wrong, you start misapplying the book. You start interpreting it incorrectly. And I cannot tell you how many sermons I hear on Jude, and I'm like, no, you're missing the whole point. The book of Hebrews, another book that absolutely... What, what, do, what do people do when they, get, when they start teaching Hebrews? Oh, wait, we've got these warning passages. Do these warning passages teach that you can lose your salvation? I mean, there's going to be no more sacrifice for sin. And there's going to be no, and those who are once enlightened. And oh, Okay, what do we do? Well, those who believe you can lose your salvation, Hebrews teaches you can. Those who don't, they have to spend all the time trying to explain it away. And I'm like, you're all missing the point. What was he, what's the purpose of Hebrews? Hebrews was written to Jews, to Jewish to those who have made some kind of profession of faith, to those who are Jewish. And it was writing to them to tell them, listen, that they are going to need a replacement, something better than everything within Judaism. And why would he be telling them they need something better? They need, in a sense, a replacement for Judaism because it was written around 66, 67 AD. What was getting ready to happen? Judaism from a biblical perspective, was about to stop existing because 70 AD was going to occur. The temple was going to be destroyed. The sacrificial system. In other words, all of what Judaism has is going to be taken away. And if they were looking to that, there's going to be no more sacrifice for sins. There's going to be no more anything. There's, there's, there, there's nothing to fall back to. In other words, they may want to be going back to Judaism, but it was trying to explain if you go back to Judaism, there, you're not going to have anything. It's, it's, there's going to be no hope for salvation because if you go back to Judaism, guess what you're going to have? Well, once 70 AD occurs, you're not going to have a temple. You're not going to have a priest. You're not going to have a sacrifice. You're not going to have a mercy seat. You're not going to have anything. Therefore, there'll be no hope. You have to look to what is better, which is Jesus Christ. Now we have a better priest, a better everything. So, so everyone just ignores the real purpose of the book. Those are just two examples. So when I get to this question, wh- why, okay, let me, why was the book written? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm leaning over to my iPad here. 
I'm leaning over to my iPad. I can't believe we're already at 44 minutes. Why was the book written? We got to get this right. We have to get this right. Why was the book written? You need to make sure you can clearly articulate why the book was written. Or as I, 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 I'm, I'm putting these together. Well, not only, I know why the book was written. It was to preserve the prophecies given by Amos. So that's simple. But why was the prophecy given? I'm going to state it that way. Why? What was the purpose? Because the purpose of the prophecy becomes the purpose of the book by default because the book is there to preserve the prophecy. So what is the purpose of this message from Amos? What was he trying to do? Well, I'm going to give you at least one. All right. This is from the Ultimate Bible Guide, page 185. All right. Are you ready? This book preserves the divinely inspired prophecies that Amos made during his ministry of an undetermined length. He and Hosea were the only writing prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. Oh, now stop right there. You see why I kept stressing where Tekoa was? Wait, he's from Tekoa. That's in the south. Why is he going to the north? I, I find that interesting. Don't you find that interesting? No, no. Okay, nobody. No, no, no. Ooh, ah, not nothing. Okay, all right. During Amos's day, the people of the northern kingdom felt politically economically, and religiously secure. Amos denounced that, they, that these were false securities. Political Assyria would soon assert itself as the major threat to Israel. Economically, the good times has led to social corruption, violence, and injustice. Religiously, the worship of the Lord has been compromised by idolatry, Amos warned that the injustice, immorality, and idolatry would bring divine judgment in the form of exile. So it seems that the purpose of Amos, the prophecy, was to warn, to declare the coming judgment of God upon them, and this judgment would come in the form of the Assyrians and the exile of the northern kingdom. That seems to be the purpose of the book. And we have to maintain that purpose of the book, right? If you go look up, oh, I'm just going to do this. I'm, I'm just going to do this. Let me see. Here. I'm going to do this. For a uh, I, I, I could be wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Lifeway. I'm just gonna type in Amos Amos Bible Study. Let's see what they show up here. All right. Okay, Amos. Now here, this is a and this is a brand new one. This is a brand new one. Okay. So I just went to Lifeway.com. Right? Just, just to show you how the modern church handles this, all right? Amos, Bible study by Jennifer Roth, Rothschild, I guess is how you would say her name. It's an eight-session Bible study for women on the book of Amos. Now, I always, I, I, oh, don't get me started on these things. I always get a little bit bothered only because of how so much of small groups and Sunday school takes place. It's like, here you go, here's your curriculum, now go teach the curriculum. And then the people basically kind of memorize the curriculum and teach the curriculum. And I can't stand that because no, you're not teaching the Bible. Even when I do a Bible study, like if you ever do a Bible study with me, I'm going to be like, well, what about this? And let's look at this and let's look at that. Like the Bible study curriculum is simply giving me a framework and what to look at, but I'm going to try to go to the text. But just note how they already, th th this is what they believe the approach is. Here we go that the book of Amos is an invitation to you, to me, to the good life. <laughs> I 
I'm sorry, that's hilarious. Hey, hey, ladies, let's get together and have a Bible study on the book of Amos because this is going to be good for you because Amos is inviting you to the good life. Now, somehow I have a feeling I may have to purchase this just so that I can tell you if I was right or if I was wrong. I have a a feeling, I have a feeling that Jennifer here, Rothschild, however you say her name, I have a feeling that she is going into the book of Amos and you know what she's doing? She's ignoring the people. She's ignoring the time. Oh, she'll, now trust me. At the beginning of the study, she'll mention all of the basic information. Who was Amos? Who it was written to? Oh, she'll give you all of that. Because this is what's so deceptive about so much preaching and teaching. It's at the beginning, they make it sound like, see, we're giving you the background. See, we're giving you the historical context. Giving you the background and the historical context is of no significance if you forget it five minutes later. It's like, okay, guys, here's the context. Here's this. You got it? All right. Now ignore that. It's about you. This is a call for you to live the good life. You got to figure out the purpose and you have to maintain that understanding of the purpose of the book. As you study the book, the minute you forget the purpose of the book, you'll begin to not rightly divide it and you'll begin to mishandle it. So it seems to us or to me, currently, and, I, and, and I'm, again, I'm, a lot of this is going to be determined by your own, your input. It's going to really help this a lot. I would challenge you when you write down, why was the book written? Why was the prophecy given? I'm combining those two. Why was the book written? Why was the prophecy given? I, what I would challenge you to do is to try to write a very succinct s- summary or let's state that, write out a very clear, let's say it this way, a very clear purpose statement for the prophecy. It seems to me the purpose was to go to the people of the northern kingdom to tell them of the coming judgment of God because of their sins and that this judgment would come at the hands of the Assyrians. That seems to me to be the purpose. Now, if I see here, oh, I know what I'll do. I I don't think, I don't think anything else. I was going to look at a couple of more, a couple of more things here just to see what I have. I don't think, let's see here. I'm going to go to Jensen's survey of the Old Testament. Um, Let's see here. Okay, um. Okay, that doesn't help us. Uh, Say the main purpose, the main purpose of Amos, uh, but Amos's main purpose in stirring conviction of sin and repentance in the heart of the people was not to alleviate his own grief over their evil ways. Rather, he yearned that the people as individuals and as a nation would come to a personal knowledge of God as their Lord. A key statement in the book uh, is the Lord's gracious invitation, seek me that you may live. So once again, I think that that's just a different way of saying, hey, guys, you're in sin. Judgment is coming and it's coming at the hands of the Assyrians. If I go to the, what do I have here? The uh, Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Uh, Does it give, it says a prophetic book of the Old Testament, noted for its fiery denunciation of the northern kingdom of Israel during a time of widespread idol worship and indulgent living. Uh, The book was named after its author, the prophet Amos, whose name means burden bearer. Amos lived up to his name as he declared God's message of judgment and dramatic fashion to a sinful and disobedient people. This is a book of judgment. This is a book of rebuke. You could say this is a book of a call to repentance. And you could say, I mean, there's a lot we can, I I don't want to give too much away. I want you to craft a purpose statement for the book. And I want you to remember that whenever you get into the book, whenever we get into Amos, 
Because modern day preaching and modern day Bible studies are going to make it all about you. This is about Amos. What preachers love to do is like, let's forget Israel. This is about America. This is what America is going to face. If America is not judge, Sodom and Gomorrah deserves an apology. What are all the stuff we have to say? And it's like, no, God will judge who he will judge. He'll have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Okay, let's just, we rip things out of their context, right? The point is, we need to figure out exactly what the purpose is and then interpret it in light of that purpose. Now, Amos is not one of those that's complicated. The purpose is pretty straightforward. It's a message of judgment. It's a message of condemnation. It's a message of a call to repentance. Not saying that God's mercy is not offered. I'm just saying that that's what the focus is. It is a message to the northern kingdom of Israel of coming judgment because of their sins at the hands of the Assyrians. You may find a different way. And if you if you want to, I, I want to see your purpose statement. But we have to get that right. We have to get, we, if we miss that, we miss everything. All right, so we have looked at who wrote the book, and we've looked at some things about who wrote the book, which was Amos. We have a pretty good idea of when the book was written and when the events occurred. I, we know, we think we know where the book was written. We, I don't think there's too much uh, significance in that, but we think it was when he went back home to Tekoa or when Amos went back. I'll just make sure I say his name. And why was the book written? There we go. I think, you know, and the next question is, whom was it written to? It was written to the Northern Kingdom of Israel, which is just to me, fa- I still think it's fascinating that he lived in the South, but he's sent to the North. And it looks like Hosea, and Amos are the only two writing prophets to the northern kingdom of Israel. And look at the date. I think the dating, I could be wrong. Hang on, let me look here. Is it is it Amos and Hosea? Like, uh, I think I think that I have that in my notes here. Um, hang on, let me look here. I think I have this in my notes. Let's see. Uh, let's see, I mean, was it in this statement? Let me look here. Let me find my notebook. Let me find my notebook. There was a there was a certain statement. I, I don't want to say something that's incorrect. I don't want to say something incorrect. But when you're doing it live this way, there's always the possibility. Um, yeah, it, it was Amos, and I believe. I believe. It's Amos and Hosea, who are the only writing prophets to the northern kingdom. All right. Yeah. Hosea. Oh, yeah. Hosea. It was Hosea were the only writing prophets. Amos and Hosea were the only writing prophets to the northern kingdom. And if we look up Hosea, let me see here. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but let me look here. If we go back to Hosea. If we go back to Hosea. Hosea, see here, do we have, do we have here, yeah, if you look at the dates, almost very similar, very similar. Now, the writing comes, seems much later, the writing comes much later, but the, during the events, it's around 753, 7, well, it goes all the way from 753 to 715, I guess, actually, if Amos was 760 when the events occurred, so this would come after. So, all right. Um, okay, maybe, maybe not. I thought the dates were almost identical, but I guess maybe they're, they're, they're not completely. So, never mind. I was going to, I just think it's interesting that those are the two that write. And so there's, there is a little kind of separation there in time. I thought they were like, wait a minute, were they pretty close at the same time? So, but we, we'll, we'll, I don't want to, I don't see, you know what I'm getting ready to do? I'm getting, I'm, I'm distracting you and I'm distracting myself. All right, that's okay. So let's go through these again. Who wrote the book? Amos. We've learned a couple of things about him. When was the book written? We've established that. Where was the book written? We've established that in Tekoa. Why was the book written? We've got, we've done pretty good on that. You're going to be writing your own purpose statement. Whom was it written to? The Northern Kingdom of Israel. All right. 
Okay, and then the last thing we need is what was going on when it was written, what was happening at the time. Well, you get a little bit of the idea. There seems to be a time of prosperity, maybe a time of peace, but of great corruption religiously, morally. You get a basic idea. So just make sure at the end you write what was going on when it was written. I'm not going to do an entire uh, podcast episode on that. Do that. And then the next thing we'll work on is we'll do a little bit of research on the geography of the book. We'll do a little bit of research on the uh, geography of the book. All right? Okay. I'm going to stop there. I got no questions. I think that was halfway okay. I think it was halfway okay. Again, just be patient as I figure out exactly the right way to work through this. But you'll notice what I'm doing. I'm trying to... I can give you this information quickly, but I'm trying to explain the reason behind it and the significance of it and why we're doing this. And I'm trying to help you with the steps of the Bible study method versus just teaching, turning this on and teaching you, Amos. I'm trying to use the Bible study method that I've taught you, and, uh, and you'll see why. So right now we're still in the book background section, and we're almost done with the vital questions. I mean, in fact, all, really all you have to do, that last, you, just one more vital question you need to answer, and unless you've got some more, is what was going on when the book was written? What was going on at the, at the time of the events of the book? Really, you just need to focus on what was going on at the time of the events of the book. What was happening? What was going on at that time? And you get a pretty good idea. All right. And you're and you're going to and, and you don't need to on that one. Don't spend a lot of time being super in depth there. And here's the reason why. The next thing you're going to do is research, research the geography of the book. And then you're going to research the historical background, the historical background. You can go more in depth. You just wanted that on that vital question. Just basically what was happening? Well, I can tell you time of peace and prosperity, but of time of corruption, socially, religiously, morally idolatry, you get the idea. All right. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost done. We're almost done with the book background. I think the rest of it will go relatively quick because I don't think we're going to have to spend a lot of time. We'll try to see if we can make it through the next part rel- relatively quick. I want to try to get us through the book background the goal is to try to get us through a decent book background by the end of this week. Just a decent book background. Okay. And you say, well, how, how in depth does this need to be? If you're doing it by itself, if you're doing book background, now this is very important. If you're doing a book background method by itself and you're not going to do anything else, it's got to be far more intensive and in depth. But because, th- listen, we're just trying to get a basic understanding of the book. We're about to spend a lot of time in the book. So we're, we don't have to necessarily have everything down perfectly because a lot of things we're going to discover when we get in the book itself. All right. So I'm going to move through this relatively quick. All right. I know you're like, you're, you've taken a long time because I'm just trying to help you get started. All right. We've almost finished all the vital questions. Now, okay. What do we need to know about the geography of the book? It's probably going to be basic. The, the historical background, that's going to be basic. The re- religious background, um, the main thing we have to really know is what was the religious corruption? What was the idolatry at the time? The political background, all right? Who was reigning as king? What was going on there? That's going to be pretty basic. I mean, we're going to be able to make through uh, uh, that. Cultural background. I mean, most of these are going to be able to be answered in minutes, I think, may- maybe an hour. And then we just summarize everything that we've got. So I know it may feel overwhelming. I'm trying to tell you, we're not even in the tunnel. We're literally already at the end of the tunnel. We, the light is blinding us. That's how, that's how close we are to the end. We're right there. Then we'll begin the survey of the book. And that's when it gets intense. This, this right now is still kind of relaxed. All right, let me know your thoughts or questions. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. If you need any help, if you're confused, if you need any resource reference tools, let me know what you need. If we can, we will purchase that for you. We've, we've sent out a number of books for people, trying to help people as much as we can. Um, so we're, we, we're doing whatever we can to try to help people in their study of God's word. 
All right. I feel like I need to say something else, but I will not. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. Keep working on the book background method to the book of Amos so that we'll be prepared for the book survey portion of our study. Thanks for listening. God bless.